Hello, uh, and welcome. This is a recording of a paper originally given in November of 2023 as part of the Dublin Festival of History. This is a recording uh, made by myself, Dr. Tim Murta, uh, slightly later on for distribution online uh, for, those of, of, for those who couldn't make the lecture back in November. Uh, I'm going to be speaking today on the topic of Henrietta Street. Uh, this is in relation to a recent publication that I was very, I'm very proud to uh, have produced in uh, cooperation with the Dublin City Council, the Dublin City Council uh, uh, Corporation Company, DCC, and the 14 Henrietta Street Museum. Um, put up by Four Courts Press. The title of this book is Spectral Mansions, The Making of a Dublin Tenement, 1800 to 1914. Uh, and I'll be speaking uh, tonight to give you an overview of the contents of the book and the work that has gone on uh, in Henrietta Street, looking into the history of both number 14, the street it's on, and Dublin City more generally uh, during, during this period of the long 19th century. So to begin, when the houses in Henrietta Street were built in the 18th century, they were some of the largest and most ornate homes in Dublin, belonging to some of the most powerful members of the Irish ruling class. However, by 1911, almost every house on the street was in use as a tenement. By 1911, the 19 buildings on the street contained over 900 people, and in several, in several instances, 100 people lived under a single roof. James Joyce, the greatest chronicler of Dublin during these years, pointed to Henrietta Street as an emblem of the city's larger decline. In one of his short stories, Joyce described how a character walked down Henrietta Street, passing by, quote, a horde of grimy children that populated the street. They stood or ran in the roadway, crawled up the steps before gaping doors, squatted like mice upon the thresholds. He picked his way deftly through all that minute vermin-like life under the shadow of the gaunt spectral mansions in which the old nobility of Dublin had roistered. So Joyce's description here of the houses in Henrietta Street as spectral mansions uh, expressed the idea of a ghostly presence played by Dublin's past. In 1900s, the idea that, that, that the city still overshadowed by its history, a city, who, a city whose best days were behind it, a deposed capital, a ghost of its former self. The theme of Dublin being haunted by its past has been used by several artists and writers. For instance, one satirical cartoon in the 1940s depicted the 20th century residents of a Dublin tenement being visit, visited by the ghosts of the building's 18th century occupants. Now, this poses a few questions. Why was this idea of being haunted by the 18th century, uh, by its ghosts of the 18th century, why was this idea so potent? And why did Henrietta Street in particular transfix observers writing on this theme like choice? Perhaps it was because Henrietta Street was so closely identified with the idea of George in Dublin. Even in Joyce's era, in the early 20th century, there was consider considerable nostalgia for the city's 18th century heyday. Georgian Dublin, period largely coterminous with the 18th century, was a period when the city could be described as thriving. Its narrow, winding lanes and alleys were being replaced by an arrangement of wide and elegant streets. It was a period of economic boom for local artisans and merchants, a strong commercial and proto-industrial economy. It was certainly a century of growth, demographically speaking. By the end of the 18th century, Dublin's uh, inhabitants, 180,000 souls, meant that it was the second biggest city in the English speaking world after London. Dublin was the seat of the Irish Parliament. It was the cultural centre of the entire island, attracting all of those who aspired to be part of polite, fashionable society. As a result, these years saw a physical transformation of the city. Entire uh, neighborhoods of upper class residences sprang up, rows of spacious townhouses. One of the most important figures in the construction of these new upper class townhouses was a man named Luke Gardner, an influential civil servant, property speculator. Henrietta Street was one of Luke Gardner's earliest projects, an experiment in creating a highly fashionable address, one reserved for a very select few. Between 1720 and 1750, Henrietta Street was constructed, soon attracting the wealthy and powerful as residents, noblemen, archbishops, the leading politicians of the day. 
For instance, in number 14, Henrietta Street, the site of the current museum, the first occupants of that house was Richard Lord Viscount Molesworth, the commander in chief of the Irish army. Now the Gardner family soon began to construct further developments across the north side of the city, stretching eastwards from Henrietta Street towards addresses such as Sackville Street, Rutland Square, today Parnell Square, Gardner Street, Mountjoy Square. Yet we must be aware of how this story of elite construction and the expansion, the remarkable expansion of the Gardner estate on the north side of the city, how this was tied up with another story about increased and increasing class divisions within Dublin's urban core. The perception that Dublin's slum problem only begins in the 19th century is a mistake. Georgian Dublin had its equivalent of the tenements with pockets of shocking deprivation. Jonathan Swift's early satires had drawn attention to the dire condition in the city that the city's poor lived in as early as the 1720s. Uh, indeed, we have a an illustration of some of the more riotous aspects of Dublin, thanks to a painting of Jonathan Swift's home turf, the area around St. Patrick's Cathedral. Uh, this image on your screen, painted by an amateur artist, John Nixon, was undoubtedly an exaggerated version of the city, in the same way that the cartoons of William Hogarth or Thomas Rowlandson exaggerated George in London in a similar fashion. But this depiction of carnivalesque license and anarchy likely captures something of the unruly nature of Dublin life, that sort of uh, way of being that was just beneath uh, uh, the well-polished lifestyles of the ruling class. It must also be remembered that 18th century Ireland and by extension Dublin was a highly sectarian society. Power was reserved for a very small Protestant ruling class, denying political rights to Catholics and poorer Protestants. Dublin, as home to the Irish Parliament, was the centre of this elite world. It was a situation that came under increasing pressure in the final decades, decades of the 18th century, as the American and French revolutions inspired Irish radicals to challenge injustices in their own country. This would culminate in the Rebellion of 1798, an insurrection aiming to establish an Irish Republic independent of Great Britain. And while Dublin remained under tight control during this fighting in 1798, uh, the rebellion nonetheless claimed two very significant figures in relation to both George and Dublin and specifically to Henrietta Street. Luke Gardner II, the grandson of the first Luke Gardner who developed Henrietta Street, had actually traveled down to Wexford during the rebellion to command a regiment of militia for the government's forces. On the 5th of June, during the crucial Battle of New Ross, Gardner had been ambushed and piked to death. Only days later, Gardner's next door neighbor in Henrietta Street, John O'Neill, the Viscount O'Neill, was wounded by rebels during an attack on Antrim Town, later succumbing to his wounds. <clears throat> the deaths of O'Neill and Gardner shocked observers. They were members of the establishment, certainly, but both men had been liberals who had supported the granting of civil and political rights to Catholics. Their deaths added to Protestant fears about the future for both Dublin and Ireland as a whole. The 1798 rebellion ended up providing the perfect opportunity for the British government to introduce a political union between Britain and Ireland. The Act of Union was pushed through, and as a result, Ireland was subsumed into the new United Kingdom. The Irish Parliament ceased to exist. Irish MPs would now travel to London to represent their country. Now, what would this mean for Ireland? Well, there's an image on your screen, which is a satirical cartoon uh, around the union debates. And uh, it, it sort of sinks in to a lot of the anxieties that Dubliners of various different backgrounds felt after and during the passage of the, the Act of Union. Many people were predicting a quick economic collapse for the city. With the Irish Parliament no longer based there, the fear was that Dublin streets would soon be empty and deserted. Now, these predictions were not necessarily wrong, but they were exaggerated. Many of the wealthy and powerful did indeed stop coming to the city in the decades after the Act of Union. But this happened gradually. Uh, indeed, in the decades after the Union, you could still see some actually quite ostentatious displays of wealth in the city, and particularly even in Henrietta Street. Yet no one could deny that the city was changing. In 1800, more than 200 Irish MPs had their residence in the city. By 1823, there were only six Irish MPs with Dublin homes. What was happening was that the politicians and aristocrats who had dominated the city's social life in the 18th century were being replaced. 
with a new and growing middle class of professionals and businessmen. One newspaper described how Dublin society by the mid 19th century was essentially a professional aristocracy. Doctors, lawyers, and clergymen form its staple ingredients. The idea of a middle-class dominance of the city's social life, particularly law and medicine, uh, was a well-worn trope in travel literature and commentary on Dublin society in the 19th century. Now, addresses like Marion Square or Sackville Street, places that had once been home to aristocrats and to politicians, now became home, homes to doctors and barristers. However, the law trade was destined to play a particularly significant role in the history of Henrietta Street. Now, Dublin was still the centre of legal education in, in Ireland. Admission to the Irish legal profession was regulated by a body known as the Society of the King's Inns, who controlled who could practice as a barrister. In the 18th century, the King's Inns had been located on a site next to the River Liffey. After 1800, however, the Society decided to move to a new site at the top of Henrietta Street. The impressive set of buildings that make up the modern King's Inns were completed in 1817. But the location of the King's Inns served to attract even more members of the legal profession to Henrietta Street. By the 1830s, nearly every other building on the street contained either attorneys, barristers, or judges, as well as housing the King's Inns library. For a period, legal education in Dublin became nearly synonymous with Henrietta Street. While there have been various proposals to construct legal uh, chambers in Dublin, nothing had ever come of this. However, in the, 19, in the 1830s, rather, a man named Tristan Kennedy, depicted on your screen here, sought to provide what was essentially an informal system of barristers chambers using the buildings in Henrietta Street. Uh, Kennedy himself was a barrister and an advocate for the reform of Irish legal education. In 1837, he had acquired Luke Gardner's former home in Henrietta Street converting it into what he called the Queen's Inn's Chambers, formerly Mountjoy House. Two years later, Kennedy opened his new Dublin Law Institute on that same premises, hoping to provide a systematic education in the law for applicants in Dublin, rather than promising barristers having to go to train at the Inns of Court in London. Over the next decade, Kennedy would make several more purchases, purchases on Henrietta Street, eventually acquiring most of the Northern Terrace, that is numbers three to 10. Uh, the street will be described as having the air of a legal university. However, and this is important, if Henrietta Street benefited from the recent growth of things like the legal profession and middle class enterprise, other parts of the city were not so lucky. The years after 1800 had been brutal for Dublin's workers and its tradesmen. The city experienced a series of sharp economic depress depressions between 1815 and 1838. For a variety of reasons, Dublin lost a good deal of its manufacturing during the 19th century, with the textile trades hit worst of all. This could be observed from Henrietta Street, which was next door to the old linen hall, uh, the city of the city, the, the centre of the city's once thriving linen trade. <clears throat> By 1842, the hall was being described as a huge, useless, lonely, decayed place. Instead, the businesses that succeeded in 19th century Dublin tended to be the food and drinks trades, firms like Guinness's, Jameson's, Jacob's. Yet these were industries that were capital rather than labor intensive and could not compensate for the decline of Dublin's traditional industries, particularly its textiles. The result was that Dublin was undergoing an industrial decline just as other cities experienced rapid industrial growth. The failure to industrialize meant a growing pool of Dublin's workers were reliant on low skill and casual labor a development that would have significant consequences for the future. For instance, this meant that most workers lived on an exceptionally slim budget, gravitating towards the cheapest possible accommodation. The result was frequent overcrowding and a decline in the quality of housing. As early as the 1820s, it could be seen in the neighborhoods bordering Henrietta Street. The nearby parish of St. Mikens or St. Mickens uh, was an area stretching south from Capel Street and Church Street down to Ormond Quay, and it was badly affected by the post-Union uh, recessions. The parish had once been home to skilled artisans, weavers, glove makers, manufacturing jobs that disappeared as the neighborhood became dominated by low paid workers, many attempting to live from the various markets that were situated in that part of the city. The economic stagnation was closely associated with environmental degradation and the spread of disease. There were outbreaks of typhus and cholera in the city during the 1830s and 1840s, 
that St. Michael's badly hit. This area was also increasingly home to starving people from the countryside who were coming to the, into the city in hopes of acquiring charity or aid. Uh, many had come to the nearby Grange Gorman, where a series of hospitals, prisons, asylums, and workhouses had sprung up. This meant a significant burden on local charities and relief measures, with the workhouse and charitable, ho charitable hospitals in this part of the city coming under intense pressure. Increasingly, those who had the resources found it desirable to escape from living in the city itself. A series of new suburbs grew up on Dublin's outskirts, with the new railways that emerged after 1834, allowing the rich to commute into the city from the new suburbs, like Blackrock, Kalini, Dalkey. Crucially, these suburban townships were outside the authority of Dublin's municipal government. This meant the suburbs didn't contribute to the city's tax revenue, effectively undermining Dublin's financial basis. The city was increasingly becoming home only to the poor. Formerly upper-class homes, including Georgian townhouses, were no longer in demand by the upper and middle classes. Instead, it was the working poor who began to move into these houses as they were converted into tenements. In Dublin, tenements tended to be 18th century homes, like we have looked at in Henrietta Street. They were usually very grand, usually built for a single wealthy family, but they were now being converted for the use of as many as 15 or 20 families. By the middle of the 19th century, significant chunks of the city were being converted into this type of accommodation. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. for a long time, the role of the law professions had meant that the houses in Henrietta Street had been safe from being converted into tenements. However, the street could not stay immune from the problems facing its neighbors forever. In 1845, the Irish potato crop failed, leading to the Great Famine. During these years, Dublin's workhouses and hospitals overflowed. Yet for the city's lawyers, like those working in Henrietta Street, the famine actually brought some new opportunities. Number 14 Henrietta Street actually became the home of an institution that was a direct result of the famine, the incumbent estates courts. To explain what this court was and why it was so significant, you must understand that Irish landlords, although they may have been pitiless in extracting rents and evicting overdue tenants, they too were often heavily in debt. This took the form of various mortgages against their properties, with debts frequently accumulating far beyond the value of the property they used for collateral. These claims by creditors to the indebted landlord's estate were known as encumbrances. As estates were often the subject of multiple encumbrances from several creditors, there was therefore multiple parties that had a claim to a plot of land or to an estate. Potential buyers were very hesitant to purchase these estates, given that there was likely to be long and costly court proceedings involving creditors. So in response, in the immediate aftermath of the famine, the government set up the encumbered estates courts, through which the state took ownership of these properties, selling them on with a new deed that meant there was no further challenges to ownership. In 1850, it was announced that the encumbered estates courts would be based in number 14, Henrietta Street. Considering that the building had been used as a solicitor's office for decades by the stage, this conversion was not surprising. The house was soon adapted, with the coach house at the back of the building being turned into a courtroom, a place where the commissioners could sit twice a week and where public sales of estates could be held. Meanwhile, every floor of the main house, number 14, was put to use. The ground floor was in use as a public office for the court, while the different estates commissioners had their private chambers on the first and second floors. The court was certainly busy, with a reputation as a no-frills, no-nonsense sort of place. Because of the volume of business coming before the court, with very large crowds assembling on the street during sales day, the decision was eventually taken to relocate the estate's courts to a new premises near the four courts, with the commissioners leaving Henrietta Street by 1860. However, Henrietta Street was soon to be dramatically transformed by a new group of occupants. In 1863, several regiments of the Dublin militia a reserve force of the British military moved into Henrietta Street, converting numbers 12 and 14 into depots or barracks. Due to the part-time nature of the militia, enlisted men were frequently accompanied by followers, i.e. their families, who accompanied them to a regiment's accommodation with the soldiers' wives and children living with them there. What this meant was that for the first time, number 14 Henrietta Street was being inhabited by multiple working-class families. <clears throat> 
Initially, there seems to have been no objection from other residents on the street to the militia. This changed in the 1870s, however, when several inhabitants made formal complaints to government concerning the noise the militia created. Tristan Kennedy, the man who had bought over half the street to turn it into lawyers' chambers, in particular complained that legal students in his buildings uh, could not concentrate with the noise of the drilling, shouting, and the, quote, eternal drumming and fife by incipient musicians. Uh, these complaints eventually resulted in the militia being relocated out of Henry Street to a new site at the uh, Four Courts Marshal Sea in 1876. Now, after these depots were relocated, their former premises, number 12 and 14 Henrietta Street, were left vacant for several years, with all the windows broken and doors left open, resulting in serious damage. It was the neglect of these buildings that, led, that left the street vulnerable to speculative landlords willing to lease out the buildings as tenements. Now, the first tenements appear on Henrietta Street in the 1870s, but the real decline occurs slightly later in the 1880s and 1890s. By the end of the century, nearly the entire street was let out as tenements. The only exceptions being number four and 11, which were still in use as offices, and the premises in number 10, which was acquired, had been acquired by the Daughters of Charity. In the case of number 14 Henrietta Street, the building had been bought in 1877 by a man named Thomas Vance. <clears throat> now Vance is an intriguing figure. A wealthy businessman, he had been a successful builder, as well as being involved in Dublin's tram companies and several of, of, of its hotels. We don't actually have an image of Vance at the moment, sadly, uh, but he was definitely a prolific figure, both in Dublin and its, and its suburbs. He uh, lived in a lavish mansion in Black Rock. He had actually laid the foundation uh, stone for Black Rock's town hall. Uh, and in many ways, Vance seemed a stereotype of Dublin's hypocritical upper classes. He made his money and let out, let out property in the city centre, but lived in the affluent suburb of Black Rock, free from contributing to the city's taxes. Yet there's more to this story. Now, Vance had long been involved in providing affordable working class housing in the city. He had actually built model lodging houses for poor families during the 1850s and 1860s. Vance's lodging houses had provided accommodation at reasonable rents, but included things such as clean toilets, clean running water, laundry and dye drying rooms. These were the type of projects that Dublin desperately needed. Uh, depicted on your screen is a sample of some of his later uh, working affordable housing, uh, the so-called Vance's Buildings, just off Bishop Street, depicted here. When Vance purchased number 14 Henrietta Street in 1877, it was reported that he intended to turn it into a better class dwelling house, quote, a matter that only a few men will do. And there is some, some, some evidence of structural uh, improvement made by Vance in number 14 Henrietta Street. Uh, he installed gas and toilets on multiple landings, as opposed to simply having a single uh, toilet or outhouse in the backyard. Uh, there were toilets located between the ground and basement levels at the rear of the house. Uh, there was also a provision of clean running water, again, on every floor uh, at, at the landing. Moreover, Thomas Vance was not the only one who saw the potential in Henrietta Street for creating what they called model tenements. Now, I know the idea of a model tenement might seem a contradiction in terms, but there was a real hope in the end of the 19th century that by carefully adapting and improving some of the older housing stock in the city, like those buildings in Henrietta Street, affordable but decent working class housing could be provided. One other sort of figure in this story in Henrietta Street uh, who ties into this is a man named Joseph Mead, depicted here on the left of your screen. Between 1887 and 1892, the majority of the houses on Henrietta Street were purchased by Joseph Mead. Now, Mead was a fairly impressive figure. He was the son of one of Dublin's most successful building, uh, building firms, uh, Mead and Son, uh, constructed huge sections of housing in the city and its suburbs. Uh, Mead's firm was one of the largest employers in the city. Uh, his he was also himself active in local politics. He had served as an alderman, as well as serving two terms as Lord Mayor in 1891 and 1892. These were the exact same years where Mead was beginning to lease out his properties in Henrietta Street as tenements. And it's, again, it's easy to see Mead as a hypocrite, a callous slumlord. Yet like Vance, Mead's story was a complex one. He was one of the founders of the Association for the Housing of the Very Poor, 
a charity aimed at providing inexpensive homes. He was the, one of the first contractors to get involved with the Dublin Artisans Dwelling Company, a body that similarly aimed to provide affordable accommodation. Like Thomas Vance, Mead also made considerable alterations to the buildings that he purchased in Henrietta Street. It was later described how Mead had, quote, practically reconstructed these houses inside and out and formed them into flats and improved them generally. Mead added purpose-built toilet blocks located at the rear of the buildings, providing additional toilets to the landings of each house. And in a city where most tenements still relied on what were called dry privies outside instead of toilets, and where most tenants shared a single tap in the backyard, this meant that the houses in Henrietta Street had better than average sanitation, although that may not have been saying much. Both Mead and Vance were involved in philanthropic bodies, as well as both being involved in providing affordable working class housing. Yet they were both also making money as tenement landlords. Why would a successful and popular businessman like Vance or Mead risk their reputation by serving as slumlords? Now, the answer is that tenement owners were not necessarily seen as disreputable in this period, or even necessarily the main people responsible for the housing prices. Instead, most people at that time blamed a category of property speculator known as middlemen. Uh, these were intermediary landlords who would take over the lease of a house, perhaps just a floor. They would then sublet rooms at a profit to desperate families. Uh, they were also known sometimes as house jobbers or house farmers. And in some buildings, there could be as many as five or six different layers of intermediary ownership of middlemen. Uh, in addition to inflating rents, by adding multiple layers of ownership, it made it very unclear who was actually responsible for repairs or maintenance or who was legally liable. So that's actually a, a, a real problem. Ten tenants of tenements, uh, these tenants rarely knew who owned the building, and thus the authorities often found it difficult to prosecute landlords for failing to maintain their property. Mead and Vance, by taking an active role in directly administering uh, their, their tenements, were actually better than many landlords of that period. Uh, however, and this is crucial, this situation would later deteriorate very severely. As early as the mid 1880s, there were complaints that middlemen were pushing, were, were moving into Henrietta Street and pushing up rents. Uh, moreover, after Thomas Vance and Joseph Mead died in 1889 and 1900, respectively, their houses were now parts of family trusts being administered by solicitors' representatives, representatives or letting agents. And it's later reported that it's at this point where you know, a third party is administering the properties that the real decline begins to set in. Now, none of this is to say that we should let landlords like Vance or Mead off the hook. While they may have, might have aimed to provide clean accommodation, they still insess, insisted on a healthy return on their investments. Unsurprisingly, the reputations of such tenement owners came increasingly under attack uh, as time went on. In 1907, a local magazine published a cartoon of a slub owner depicted on the right-hand side of your screen which is likely a caricature of Joseph Mead. Uh, there's various little hints to him, uh, notably uh, the fact that he's de described as being the uh, uh, a member of a philanthropic reform association. It also mentions in the text there that the, this particular slub owner uh, managed to sell the fireplaces from the original building to cover the cost of, the, uh, of, of his purchase, which was an accusation leveled at Mead. So by the end of the, of, of the 19th century, by the early 1900s, Henrietta Street found itself part of a large section of the city that had been given over to tenement accommodation. In many cases, the houses, of, the houses in use of tenements were formerly very elite Georgian homes. Now, this was the result of several decades of a change in the quote unquote slum geography of the city. Uh, as redevelopment in traditional working class neighborhoods like the Liberties as well as a lack of new building elsewhere, pushed poorer renters into recently tenementized buildings on the north side of the city. This is a, uh, a map from 1918. Uh, it's a survey of the north side of the city and it is color coded. The yellow parts are tenement accommodation, while the red sections are derelict sites. And I think that sort of shows you something about how sort of tenements by the early 1900s were sort of spread across the north side of the city, roughly sort of coordinating along with what used to be the old Gardner estate in the 18th. Uh, 
but you can sort of see uh, 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 the sort of social logic of, of, of how they'd spread. Now, tenements initially, when a, a street would become a tenement, it was not always a case of the main buildings, those lovely Georgian townhouses becoming tenements first. What usually occurred was that back lanes, stable lanes that were on the back of these properties were tenementized first uh, before that sort of spread eventually going onto the main street. Uh, for instance, this image in the bottom right-hand side of your screen is of Henrietta Lane, uh, which was at the back of Henrietta Street. And if you can see in the distance, there is just the back of number 15 Henrietta Street uh, uh, just there. Nonetheless, as the tenement phenomenon gradually creeped over more and more of the city centre, the extent of the city's tenement problem was increasingly got, gaining the attention of observers. By 1880, as early as 1880, two-fifths of the city's inhabited houses were let out as tenements. Of these nearly 10,000 buildings, over 2,000 were deemed as unfit for human habitation, despite at that point containing 30,000 residents. Now, we might ask, by 1900, what was life like for those living in these tenements? While we have oral histories relating to the 1920s and 1930s, we have fewer first-hand accounts for earlier periods of tenement life. But we can make some informed guesses from various sources, including first-hand testimony. When a man or woman woke up inside of a tenement, it was rare that they were getting out of a comfortable bed, with many families making do with sacks and rags as makeshift mattresses. These, there were very rarely proper facilities for washing or drying, meaning that clothes had to be strung on lines across a room or else hung out the windows. With so many families living on a thin budget, clothes were often hand-me-downs. Uh, one writer in this period declared how that half the population of Dublin were clothed in the cast-off clothes of the other half. For most people, the room they woke up in would have been bare. With poorer Dubliners struggling to live on low wages, there was little budget for any frills. As a visitor in 1913 described it, quote, the notes of a bird in a cage never sound, and not a flower in the windowsill brightens the tenement room. We might ask also, what did people in these buildings, people who lived and were the lifeblood of tenement Dublin, what did they do for a living? How did they earn a wage? Well, at the beginning of the 20th century, between a quarter and a third of Dublin's male workforce were classified as general laborers while many more were employed in casual lines in retail and in carrying trades, uh, such as porters. In a similar vein, the single most common occupation for women in this period was domestic service, with about 40% of the female workforce employed as servants in 1901. What this all meant was that a large section of Dublin's workforce consisted of men and women who earned their living in lowly paid and largely unstable work. There was thus a large floating population vulnerable to victimization by employers suffering from low wages and long hours. This lack of stable and well-paying jobs was reflected in Henrietta Street. A census in 1901 revealed that the most common job amongst those who lived in Henrietta Street was general laborer, hardly a surprise. The second most common job, again unsurprisingly, was domestic servant. The, two, the next two biggest categories of employment in the street were the construction industry and those working in the tailoring uh, or, or clothes making trades. In both of these sorts of occupations, there were usually seasonal periods of slack work. Only a small number of people living in Henrietta Street, less than 5% of those employed, were working in better paid industrial or factory work. And this reflected conditions in the city as a whole. One interesting feature of Henrietta Street during its period as a tenement was that it was quite a young street. In 1901, the average age in Henrietta Street was 23, with roughly a quarter of the residents there living, living there were being under 10 years of age. The result was that the children uh, of Henrietta Street played a very big uh, part in day-to-day -day life there. Because Henrietta Street is a cul-de-sac, with the King's Inn at one end, the street was a favorite place for children to play. In winter, crowds of boys played football. In summer, children played traditional games like Tip the Cat. There was a whole range of traditional street games and rhymes amongst Dublin's working class children, many of which have now disappeared. Children were an incredibly part 
a big important part of the city's street life as a whole. As one man commented in 1914, in no city in these islands have the children such a freedom, I may say such a possession of the streets as in Dublin. Here's a, an image from the 1920s of children playing at the top of Henrietta Street. Now, none of this is to say that the street was always a safe place. Like any impoverished area, it contained its share of social problems. For instance, in 1878, two men were arrested for arranging dog fights in Henrietta Street. One of them was later charged with hitting the policeman arresting. In addition, it seems that bare knuckle boxing matches were occasionally organized in Henrietta Street, which considering the street's proximity to the King's Inn, uh, such activity was somewhat surprising. Uh, as one lawyer of this period remarked, it is surprising that a locality which is the home of law should be also the home of lawlessness. While these reports attest the lively character of the street, that should not distract from other more grim realities. Like most other tenement areas in Dublin, Henrietta, Henrietta Street suffered from an appalling rate of mortality and a really shocking rate of infant mortality. Dublin City had the highest infant mortality rate within the British Isles for every year between 1899 and 1913. This sad statistic was reflected in the lives of Henrietta Street's residents, as data from the 1911 census makes clear. For example, in number seven, Henrietta Street, we find Catherine Davis, a 69-year-old widow and domestic servant who had given birth to 14 children, only two of whom had survived. Next door, in number eight, we find the 41-year-old Mary O'Neill, who had also given birth to 14 children, only one of whom survived, an 11-year-old daughter named Sarah, who lived with her. These all attest to how Victorian Dublin was an, an extremely unhealthy city. Its many tenements were a breeding ground for all the major killers of the age, typhus, typhoid fever, scarlet fever, cholera, diphtheria. Dublin experienced its last major smallpox epidemic only in 1903. Tuberculosis was a persistent problem with instances of the disease only peaking in 1904 when it accounted for 13,000 deaths in the city that year. Effort, efforts to eradicate TB would stretch well into the 1960s. Now, numerous reports were commissioned to explain why the disease continued to be so prevalent in Dublin. And they all pointed to the same two factors, inadequate housing and poor nutrition. Now, certainly the role of diet was important with such a large portion of the population living on unreliable wages. Many were in a state of perpetual malnourishment. However, by the end of the 19th century, Dublin officials had finally realized that a war on disease would also be a war on poverty itself. And this would mean at least some attempt to tackle the city's housing problem. However, to many middle-class observers, it seemed that Dublin's housing crisis was simply unsolvable. Since the 1880s, Dublin Corporation had begun to build, but it found it difficult to keep rents low. Despite its best efforts, by 1914, Dublin Corporation had only completed 1,300 units. Even when taken besides more impressive records of bodies like the Dublin Artisan Dwellings Company or the Ivy Trust, the amount of new working class housing being provided by the early 20th century was little more than a drop in the ocean of what was needed. Decades of overcrowding and neglect had undermined the structural integrity of many of the existing tenements with many being kept upright only thanks to external supports. Tragically, in several cases, these measures were not enough. In one particularly well-known instance, on the 2nd of September, 1913, two tenement houses in nearby Church Street, just around the corner from Henrietta Street, collapsed, killing several, seven people. Among the dead were two children, aged four and five, while another eight residents were seriously injured. Now, there had been similar tenement collapses in the city before, but this time there was a notably greater public reaction. The funerals of the young children killed provoked emotional responses from the public. The Church Street disaster came at a particularly historic time for the city. Less than a week before the collapse of the building, an event had begun that would engulf the city for the next several months, the infamous 1913 lockout. A defining moment in the history of Dublin's working class, it was one of the bitterest uh, confrontations between capital and labour that the city had ever seen, lasting five months, and despite the noble efforts of Dublin labour, resulting in a bitter defeat for the workers. In the wake of both the lockout and the Church Street disaster, 
an official inquiry was set up, tasked with investigating Dublin's housing conditions. The resulting report uh, of the Departmental Committee of Inquiry into the Housing of Dublin's Working Classes. This resulting report stands as one of the most important social documents for the city of this age. What it revealed was astonishing. More than 20,000 families in 1914 lived in one room accommodation. This, re this represented 23% of the entire population. Among those living in the tenements, over 22,000 people lived in third class buildings classified as unfit for human habitation. One of the report's most shocking revelations, although perhaps it shouldn't have been shocking, was that some members of Dublin Corporation were themselves tenement landlords. It claimed that 102 tenement houses were actually owned by corporation members, and most were deemed to be in very poor repair. The, house, the housing inquiry did more than just describe the city's problems. It also put forward concrete solutions. It proposed the building of 1,400 new housing units to be built sorry, excuse me, 14,000 new housing units to be built by the corporation itself and not by private companies. These were to be located on the outskirts of the city. Now, the report in 1914 admitted that this would be expensive. The estimated cost was 3.5 million pounds. It was a huge sum for the time. It was 10 times what the corporation had spent on housing over the previous 30 years. Moreover, this would require state assistance with 100% loans coming from the government. This ambitious and sweeping proposal, unfortunately, was very unlikely to be implemented, at least not anytime soon. Remember, the year is 1914. We are on the verge of the First World War. Now, the events of the period 1914 to 1923 have come to be known as the Irish Revolution, a process which included the First World War, but also insurrection, insurgency, and ultimately the Irish Civil War. While the Irish Revolution was an incredibly important period, it is simply too vast for me to do it justice within this talk. Yet, despite the importance of these years, we should also be aware of how much did not change with the Irish Revolution. There was a remarkable continuity in the social problems facing Dublin. The interactability of the city's tenements was confirmed in 1926, when a new census took place, the first since 1911. All of the problems revealed in previous censuses were still there. In 1926, it was revealed that almost half of the city's population lived in dwellings of only one or two rooms, while over 23% lived in accommodation with four or more people per room. Now, the city had seen some moderate improvements in infant mortality, but it was still very much higher than almost anywhere else in the country, as well as being uh, much higher than the mortality rates anywhere else in Britain. Yet, for all of this, there are still some very radical ideas being floated about Dublin's future in the 1920s. Notably, in 1922, a report entitled Dublin of the Future was published. The report was the brainchild of Patrick Abercrombie, a British town planner. It called for large-scale intervention in the city with new thoroughfares and traffic hubs combined with new bridges and public buildings. And a taste of that plan's boldness can be seen here in this image, uh, an illustration from that report that's on your screen. It's what was being suggested to be done in Henrietta Street. It proposed the straight out demolition of Henrietta Street and its surrounding area, although it would preserve the King's Inn being, you can see there a little blue arrow pointing to it. The idea that the King's Inn would remain and facing onto it where Henrietta Street would once be, would be the piazza of a new national cathedral, uh, complete with 500 foot campanile. Now, this never came to pass, quite obviously, uh, but these suggestions give some sort of taste of the boldness uh, of plans being discussed in this era. However, it's odd that of that report, Dublin of the Future, the best remembered image is not any of these admittedly fairly dramatic proposals, but instead the report's frontispiece, an image created by the artist Harry Clark and entitled The Last Hour of the Night. It depicts a demonic ghoul towering over Dublin. On the left hand are three iconic buildings which had been burnt during different phases of the recent revolution. The GPO, burnt during the Rising, the Customs House, during the War of Independence, and the Four Courts in the Civil War. Yet, on the opposite side, the ghoul, this demon, has his hands outstretched to a dilapidated tenement, its residence standing in the street. 
Tellingling, the city on the right hand side, over the tenements on the right hand side, overshadows the historic ruins on the left, suggesting perhaps that Dublin's social problems were of a greater magnitude than the political conflicts of the revolution. Also, tellingly, the public building buildings depicted on the left, all of which had been burnt in the previous 10 years, all would be repaired by 1931. Yet the problem of the city's tenements would remain far longer. Now, that is the end of the talk. I thank you for listening. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about Henrietta Street and its relation to the sort of wider social history of the city, I would encourage listeners to check out the museum itself at number 14 Henrietta Street and online to keep an eye out for future talks. And I would hope to you consider uh, buying the book that this was part of Spectral Mansions, the making of Double Tenement. Thank you.